we are continuing our series on who we are with an episode that I am calling You Are Not What You Do or What You've Done. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. Now, there's both a negative and a positive to this. If you've been a super high achiever all your life, or really good looking, or extremely intelligent, if you've had great jobs, you may put a lot of value in that, and you might have to sort of separate yourself from that. If you're on the other end of the spectrum, and you've really never been someone who's had great jobs, if you've never been known as being the smartest person in the class, the fastest person in the class, the prettiest person anywhere, (laughs) then you also have to separate from that to recognize that's not who you are either. And so we're going to talk about both of those. And I want to stop right off the bat and just say a lot of times in this country, We have a tendency to almost want to identify and glamorize even our sinfulness or our weaknesses. Um, You know, I think about a couple of different things, which I struggle with myself. So, you know, you have the big and beautiful trend, which I, I too have struggled. I've struggled with my weight. I've struggled with my body image. I struggled with anorexia way back, you know, right out of high school or while I was still in high school. So I've been on both ends of the spectrum in terms of I've been very underweight and for the wrong reasons, doing it the wrong ways. And then I've also struggled, you know, not caring and gaining too much weight and honestly being gluttonous, like just I like what I'm eating and I want to eat more of it and I don't even care that I'm full. I'm going to keep eating because I'm just going to do that. So I've embraced the whole hot, um, big, beautiful, like this is just who I am. And I've also um, struggled on the other end of it, thinking that my worth is only, um, you know, so much. I'm, I'm only so valuable if I'm this thin or this size or what have you. And both extremes are not good. There's also like the whole hot mess, you know, you're a mom and you're a hot mess. And as if being frazzled and not keeping up at your house or being stressed out or yelling at your child is like a norm, an an okay thing. And I think there's a danger on both ends of that spectrum too. We don't want to lift up moms to feel like if they're not achieving a certain level of, you know, the house has to be dusted all the time. And if you're not making the Martha Stewart meals and then you're not valuable enough. But on the same token, I'm not sure that we want to glamorize being stressed out and being overwhelmed with motherhood. Why don't we just lower our expectations or have the expectations that fit with our families? schedules and with what's going on and, and be okay with that and say, well, I can't do X, Y, and Z. You know, one of the things that we never did in my family, I, I had four children in eight years and I told them straight up, like, I am not able to have you all be in every sport. I just can't be six places at once. And we don't have the money because I stayed home for six years. And so I flat out said, this is something that's not going to work for our family. I'm not saying it can't work for your family. I'm not giving them a moral code. Like if you do sports with your kids, my kids did sports. I just made them choose one, choose one sport you want to do. I can't take you to four. So you choose one. And if, if it works, then keep doing it. And if you didn't really care about it that much, great. We'll choose something else. Um, but you know, instead of being frazzled and thinking you have to do it all, just 
find what you can do and be okay with that. And so anyway, I just wanted to say that sometimes we really tend to glamorize weaknesses and even sins at times instead of instead of acknowledging that you know this is who I am and it's okay and I'm I'm working on it and not going to either extreme. So, having said that, I want to go to the Bible and I want to discuss with you a couple of people who may have found it easy to go the wrong way. So, first I'm going to take you to Judges chapter 6, 7 and 8 with the account of Gideon. So, God called Gideon in a pretty amazing way. If you haven't read the account of Gideon, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm leaving a lot out for the sake of time. And so do yourself a favor. And after you've listened to this podcast, go read the account of Gideon. Underline, look at all that happened and um, go from there. So anyway, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. He called him a mighty warrior. Gideon's like, you have no idea who I am. I'm the weakest and the smallest. And God basically said, hey, look, I'm going to use you. Gideon didn't believe God so that God had to do miraculous signs, not once, but twice to get Gideon to believe him. Then Gideon called a huge army of men and God said, no, 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 Gideon, look, If you take this huge army of men to defeat the Midianites, you're going to think it was on your own strength. I don't want that. So get rid of all of these but 300 men, which is what Gideon took with him. 300 men who were armed, by the way, with a trumpet, a jar with a torch on it, in it, and apparently a sword. So their sword must have been in its sheath because they carried the trumpet, and they carried their jar with the torch. And God's way of rescuing them, in part, was that they would smash these jars, blow the trumpet, have this light, and create such chaos in the Midian camp that the Midianites basically started killing each other. So, so far, Gideon's done very little. He's got 300 men around the camp, they blow a trumpet, smash a jar, and the Midianites just start killing themselves. So that's how it started. Now, they did pursue and they did capture, they did kill, but there were definitely low points along the way. So Gideon came to a town of Israelites and he asked for some bread for his men. They were weary, they were hungry. And this town said, no, we we just, um, we're not sure you're doing the right thing. So Gideon left, continued to pursue these kings that he was after. And when he captured them, he came back and killed the men of these to- this town because they didn't give him bread. So he killed his feather- fellow Israelites. Not great. When it was all said and done, the people said, Gideon, be our king. And he said, no, I'm not going to rule over you. The Lord rules over you, which on the one hand seems super humble and amazing. But then I also think, should we have good, righteous leaders who keep people in line? I mean, anyway, Gideon didn't go down that path. He said, no, God is, God's going to be your, your leader. He said, I don't want any of the plunder, but I just want an earring from each of you. And the people gladly gave him their earrings. And lo and behold, he made it into an ephod, which is like a priestly garment, like an apron type thing. It didn't have sleeves. And the people worshipped it. Then we read that Gideon had 70 sons. And in case you're wondering how his wife did with that, it said he had many wives and at least one concubine. So here's this guy who's been a reluctant leader, who's doubted, who hasn't had a whole lot of faith. But boy, he gets a little taste of success and he goes back and kills all the men of a town because they didn't follow along with his program right off the bat. 
He makes something that becomes an idol. He has all kind of, of wives after this, like, I'm the man, everybody wants to marry me, and I'm going to marry everybody, and I'm just going to have child after child after child after child. So for all his reluctance and doubt, little on, and thinking he was so little, just a little bit of success seemed to have gone to his head pretty quickly. I want to show you somebody else in the Bible who was totally different. So in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 4, we learn that Daniel and his companions have been brought from Israel. They were of nobility. So we already know they were kind of a big deal in Israel. They were brought over to Babylon to serve Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what we're told about these people in Daniel 1, verse 4. All these men said uh, they're young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand. The total package, right? Good looking, smart, quick to adjust to whatever's going on. Daniel was it from a young age. So he enters Nebuchadnezzar's service. And so you think, eh, it'd be easy for him to base his identity on. Like, I'm nobility. I'm good looking. I'm pretty quick. But that's not what we see. See, in Daniel chapter 2, and again, I'm paraphrasing this, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he doesn't know what the dream means, but he knows that it's significant. So he tells his wise men, I want you to tell me the dream. I want you to tell me what the dream means. And they said, well, you know, we can't do that. There's there's no nobody who could tell you what you've been dreaming and then interpret the dream. So just tell us what the dream is. We'll tell you what it means. And he goes, no, I'm sick of this. I don't know if you're telling me the truth or if you're just telling me what I want to hear. So if you're really wise men and if you really have special powers, tell me the dream and then tell me what it means. And they went, I mean, there's no way. So King Nebuchadnezzar said, kill all the wise men. I don't like any of these guys. So the executioner comes to Daniel's door, knocks on the door like, hey, I'm here. You're going to meet your demise. And Daniel speaks to him with wisdom and tact and says, what's going on? I mean, why are you showing up at my house to just destroy me? What's going on? And the executioner tells him and he says, let me talk to King Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel is brought before the king and he asks for time. And the king gives him time. So Daniel and his friends spend a night in prayer. And during the night, God gives Daniel the dream and its interpretation. Immediately, Daniel's response is to praise God. He just bursts into this song of praise because God has given him this dream that he and his friends have been praying for all throughout the, the night. So he contacts the executioner who brings Daniel to King Nebuchadnezzar and makes a point of saying, hey, I've found somebody. I've been out looking all night and I've found somebody who can interpret this dream as if he had anything to do with it. But Daniel, when he tells King Nebuchadnezzar the dream and the interpretation. He says, no one could do this, but there is a God in heaven. And then he goes on to say, it's not because I have greater wisdom. So already Daniel is saying, look, you asked for something impossible. The good news is there's a God in heaven who can do what you asked for. And then as he's explaining this, he's being sure to say, look, this is I, I'm not telling you this because I have greater wisdom. And then as he's finishing up, he does something else, which is remarkable. At Daniel's request, we're told, 
The king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as administrators. So when the king heard the dream, when he heard the interpretation, he immediately put Daniel in a high position. He stayed at the palace. But Daniel said, well, it wasn't just me. I mean, I just told you I was the the spokesperson for what God revealed to me, but I don't have any greater knowledge than anybody else. And by the way, um, my friends over there, they were part of this. So if you're going to, you know, put me in an important position, you should be sure to put them in important positions too. Think of that. If Daniel was all about finding his worth in his achievements and even his looks and his intelligence, he wouldn't have given honor and glory to God. And he certainly wouldn't have said, my friends are part of this. He would have been too busy patting himself on the back and rejoicing at his own good fortune to notice his friends, but that's not what he did. He is the perfect example of our responses when good things happen or when bad things happen. Because as you read the book of Daniel, you know Daniel was put in the lion's den. You know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in a blazing hot, fiery furnace that even killed the soldiers who were putting them there. And whether they were achieving something unbelievable that no one could do except if God blessed them to do it, or whether their life was on the line, they turned to God and they put their hope and their trust in God no matter what the outcome. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace were like, you know what, we're not going to bow down and worship this idol. Even if we die, we refuse to worship anybody but our God. So they weren't even saying, you know, since we're such great people, God is for sure going to rescue us. They were saying, look, God can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, We're sticking with him. This is so important. I work in a nursing home and I can assure you there are so many wonderful things about working in a nursing home. For one thing, I love being in the trenches. I love being the hands and feet of God and just being, um, just being in the trenches, like I said, with the salt of the earth. It's one of the things I love. I also love that at that point in your life, it doesn't matter if you were the insurance salesman who had the big house, or if you were the teacher, or if you were the superintendent of schools, or if you were a farmer's wife or the farmer, or if you were homeless, or if you were put in a nursing home because you had a terrible addiction. It doesn't matter because you know what? Everyone sits at the same tables and you, whether you are homeless or you are the richest man in town, are sitting right across from that other person and it really levels the playing field because you know what? It doesn't matter. At that point, you need help. Either your body is failing or your mind is failing, and it doesn't matter. And what you see is people starting to take care of each other again and realize (laughs) we all have a tiny bedroom with a few pieces of clothing and just a few things. So you know what? We're not all that special. And that's one of the things I love. I also love the fact that at the nursing home, they treat us the same way. It doesn't matter what else you do outside of work. When you walk into that nursing home, they're just 
needing you to take them to the bathroom, to get them dressed, to serve them their food, to give them a bath, whatever. So it doesn't matter. And I love how we can joke right and left all day long. You know, one of the things that I had done, my introduction to little things, I used to say I was a worrier and I'm type A, child of God. And again, that goes back to what I was opening with. You know, a lot of times we glorify or glamorize our sins. And as I was really looking into the concept of worry in the Bible, Jesus says, don't. It's a command. Don't worry. So if I'm going, oh, I'm a worrier, I'm like glamorizing what what God is telling me not to do. It's like saying, I'm a thief. I go shoplift when I know God says don't. So anyway, I, I also, on the same token, say that I'm type A, which I tell you to try to, you know, <laughs> get to know me a little bit. And one of the men at the nursing home said to me one day, I was really dragging. I was just trying to get through the day. And a lot of times when I'm super tired, I have a hard time thinking. And so I was trying to do, you know, this and then go to this and go to this. And he said to me, Amber, I got to tell you, it's well known around this place that the, you are one of two ways. You are either full speed ahead and get out of her way because she's getting everything done or you're dead. And today you are dead. <laughs> so anyway, I love the fact that I can go to work and and those people, they have no filter. They They tell you exactly how it is. And they also, like I said, they don't care what else you're doing. They don't care what you look like. I never wear makeup to work at all. I do do my hair. But just yesterday, one of the men said to me, I like your hair. And here I thought he was giving me a compliment. I said, oh, thank you. And he said, it looks just like mine. It looks like you never comb it. <laughs> I was like, and I love my job. I love being with people like that who just don't care and love to have fun and treat each other like a family and with love. And that's just all to say that God looks at the heart. It doesn't matter if you're in your best season or your worst season. It doesn't matter how much money you've made in your life or you if you're dying pen penniless. It doesn't matter if anybody has ever told you you're beautiful or you have known your whole life that beauty is not something God gave to you. It doesn't matter if you came from a ancestry of very wealthy people who were high respected, or if you were the person who grew up on the other side of the tracks, that does not matter in God's kingdom. Our identity is based completely on the fact that we are children of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ. So I don't know where that's gonna put you today. Some of us need to repent because we have looked at our achievements as something special or that, or because we've had enough money or looks to get to a certain position of life. And some of us need to stop despairing because we're redeemed. And it doesn't matter where we fit on the social scale or if anybody knows our name. Because as long as our names are written in the book of life that God keeps, that's all that matters and in heaven it's going to be the nursing home glorified times <laughs> exponentially because we're all going to be at the same table all of us no matter what we did no matter what we looked like no matter how much money we made this has been little things because in god's kingdom the little things are the big things